Okay. Uh, so today uh, we are going to talk about the representation learning and the uh, autoencoder. So uh, the first question is, uh, what is uh, representation? So uh, if you just Google uh, this question and uh, potentially you will find the answer like uh, uh, representation is basically in the space of allowed models but also takes into account the effect uh, that we are expressing models in some formal language that may encode some models more easily than others. Uh, if you just uh, uh, search the answer from Wikipedia and uh, we just uh, extract the keywords, you will get representation learning uh, is to discover the representations. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is a representation? Actually, I don't think these two definitions are kind of friendly for most of beginners. So uh, let's move on. Uh, there's a popular paper uh, which makes definition for the representation clear. Representation is a feature of data that can entangle and hide more or less the different explanatory factors or uh, variation behind the data. Uh, let's just ignore uh, all the following words. So representation is a feature. And then the question is, uh, what is a feature? So uh, we make the summaries as follows. First, a feature could be uh, the input vector to a machine learning model. A feature could also be any interpretable vector uh, in a machine learning model. So uh, let's start with some examples. Consider a simple binary logistic regression model. Let's look at the first figure. All these points are linearly separable. So uh, in this manner, the feature could uh, just be x1, x2, and 1, uh, where 1 is a bias term, if we make sure to incorporate the bias term. Then if we look at the second figure, actually the data points are, are not linear separable, but they are still separable. So perhaps we can apply some polynomial color functions on data points, and uh, we will get the feature like uh, x1 square, x2 square, x1 times x2, x1, x2, and 1 where the bias term is also incorporated. So uh, if you look at the figure three, I think things will uh, be much more complicated. But anyway, here, all the inputs are the features and uh, all the features can be regarded as the representation. Uh, so let's come back to the definition. Uh, the input vector can be regarded as a feature, but actually, uh, if we are doing with the deep learning model, uh, deep learning model is typically trained under the end-to-end -end manner. That means we just input the raw data and we will get the output. So in most cases, we do not actually need the handcrafted features. In that sense, we do not discuss the input vector. So uh, when talking about the representation, we often focus on the latter case, that is uh, representation uh, is any interpretable vector in a machine learning model. Uh, so for example, it can be the image embeddings in a recognition task. Uh, it can be the torque sentence embedding or uh, uh, natural language processing. Uh, actually here, there's no significant difference between the token and the words. And it can be the early embedding or the latent vectors in autoencoder or TCA, uh, which will be covered later. And people often uh, work with the multi-model uh, representation. And actually, uh, almost every vector in the neural network can be regarded as a representation as long as it is interpretable. So for example, uh, in an object recognition task, uh, the embedding is actually a representation. It is a discriminative representation uh, used for the face verification. And uh, for the word embedding or the token embedding, so uh, let's just take the word to vector as instance. Uh, the word to vector contains uh, continuous bark and skip grain, uh, these two models. So uh, actually there are a couple of approaches to implement these two models. Let us just pick one of them to uh, illustrate these two methods. First, uh, let's focus on the continuous bag of words. So uh, in this model, 
uh, for both input and outputs, uh, the input vectors are actually the record vector. So here, V denotes the uh, vocabulary size and D is an embedded size. As you can see, uh, there is a linear layer between the input layer and uh, uh, the intermediate embedding layer. So uh, after uh, you train this model, uh, and uh, after the model uh, is converted, then uh, if we just extract each row vector of the W matrix, and each row vector is just uh, uh, the word embedded. Uh, and for the skip gram, actually, you can apply the similar methods that have been applied in a uh, continuous bank of words. And here, we can just switch to uh, a new method uh, to do skip gram. So we just randomly initialize uh, an embedding for each vector, for each word. And then we just use the centralized word to predict the contextual words. So after the uh, model converts, then each vector is exactly uh, the word embedding. So that there's no learnable with matrix in the skip grant, but you can add uh, a, a with matrix, or you can even add a linear layer, uh, that depends. And uh, for the audio parts, so uh, there's a model called uh, wave two vector. So as you can see, uh, in this model, the input is just a, a wave file. And uh, you can think of that uh, there are only two layers here. So uh, we would apply a one-dimensional convolutional neural network to the wave file. And we will get our embedding layer Z. And then we would apply uh, the core convolutional neural network on the embedding Z. And we will get the uh, contextual embedding Z. So our first objective is just to uh, make the current embedding Z uh, be close to uh, its corresponding uh, contextual embedding uh, as soon as possible, as much as possible. Uh, so this is lots of objective. Uh, actually, this model is trained under the self-supervised uh, friendship. So uh, no neighbor is uh, included uh, during training. And uh, we will learn uh, this general representation Z uh, that can be input to a speech recognition system. So actually, typically, uh, if you can uh, recall that uh, in homework one, part two, or homework three, part two, uh, we potentially use the MFCC or MF spectral features. Uh, but if you apply the only embedding like uh, this, if you directly apply this Z embedding, uh, perhaps that is better than uh, in MFCC. Uh, later, some advanced uh, papers and research are proposed, like uh, the wave 2 vector 2.0 and the VQ wave 2 vector. Uh, so if you're interested in, uh, you can just uh, go through those papers later. And uh, people often focus on the multimodal representation. And here is just an example. So uh, this is uh, uh, the architecture of speech to face. So the final goal is that if we want to input uh, an audio and spectrogram, uh, we want to reconstruct the face from this audio feature. Uh, so how to this model? So first, we have an uh, image uh, the corresponding image of the audio and uh, uh, passing the image into a convolutional neural network and we will get uh, face embedding. So then passing the face embedding to the decoder. So actually this encoder decoder model will be covered. Uh, uh, so. so we will uh, reconstruct the face and later, uh, so similarly we will get the audio embedding through the audio encoder. Uh, and then we can apply just uh, some lots of objectives so that we will make this audio embedding uh, and uh, this face embedding be as close as possible. And uh, we will make the reconstructed face derived from this audio embedding and then the reconstructed face derived from this uh, uh, face embedding uh, be as close as possible. So uh, after the uh, model converts, we just remove this face part and we just keep this uh, audio part. So. Uh, and audio is uh, passed to the encoder, then uh, a face is, is expected to be reconstructed. So uh, here, uh, both the video feature and the audio feature can be regarded uh, as the uh, multimodal representation. Uh, so here, uh, the representation is a feature of data that can entangle and hide more or less the different explanatory factors of variation uh, behind the data. And uh, how to interpret this definition? Uh, I think we can uh, come back to this model. 
Uh, actually, this model uh, does not implement uh, the disintegral integral function, but we can make such an uh, assumption. So imagine that, uh, uh, so imagine that each phase factor, or uh, each phase embedding, or each only embedding, just uh, uh, just has ten elements. That is ten dimensional vector. Then we would expect that if we want to generate uh, the phase from this embedding, we would expect that each element, uh, so each element should correspond to a specific, a unique uh, attribute. Like, uh, for example, in the first dimension. Uh, listed point is related to uh, the age, and listed point is related to uh, the male or female. So uh, things like this. Uh, this is just an example to illustrate this definition. So uh, what is a feature? A feature is uh, that any interpretable vector uh, in the machine model. Uh, now, uh, I think the question is how to learn a good representation. Uh, so let's continue with this topic. Actually, we need to consider two things. Uh, first is optimization strategy. And then can my model learn by STD and generalize well? So here, we need to design an efficient and effective neural network uh, backbone uh, based on the depths and skip collections. I need to consider the dropout, mesh norm, and the linear norm. So not that STD uh, typically works better in convolutional neural networks, and NM works better in the uh, the current neural networks and the norm perhaps works better uh, in the convolutional neural network and the uh, uh, MLP and the layer norm works better in the uh, recurrent neural networks. This is just based on the experience. And then uh, the representation. So can my model capture the inner structure of the data? So first, we need to determine uh, which vector in our model should be selected as the representation and then uh, which loss of objective should be uh, used to learn, uh, for example, the desired representation. So uh, both the optimization and the representation are actually uh, typically complementary. And uh, so for the representation learning, uh, we also need to think why some networks are better than other networks in specific domain or in specific tasks. So uh, for the image, uh, the convolutional neural networks are good because uh, the features uh, tend to be translation invariants. And for the recurrent neural networks, they are good for the sequences because the features have long term dependencies. And why is attention used for sequence to sequence? Uh, because, yeah, as mentioned in the lecture, uh, a word representation in a decoder should be correlated to a couple of words in the encoder. Uh, so finally, uh, instead of thinking uh, what model should we select, uh, we should think why does this model make sense? Why does a specific block uh, in this model make sense? Uh, we should also try to explain uh, our model. So for example, for the sentiment analysis uh, example, CNs are often better than RNs. Why? Because uh, in this task, typically some words will contain the uh, positive signal information or negative signal information. So that we do not actually need the long-term dependency. So uh, CN, CNs are good. Maybe uh, it is better just based on its experience. And uh, you can train the uh, model under the end-to-end manner or under the uh, unsupervised function. Or you can train your model first on an alternate task and then come back and move on to the task that you are really interested in. Uh, so for example, on the transfer learning, imagine that the tasks, uh, so for the task that you are interested in, you do not have enough data. So you have to train your network on an easy to train task where you have uh, the enough data. Then you just uh, uh, come back to the current task and fine tune your model. Uh, this is what you actually have done in the home two part two. That is classification task and verification task. And then, uh, semi supervised learning. So, uh, if you want to build a translation model uh, translating from English to French, then uh, the same thing should happen is that uh, you do not have enough pairwise French to English data. So, uh, what can you do? Uh, a possible solution is that you can first, oh, let's just imagine that you will use the sequence to sequence model to solve this problem. So, 
uh, first, you can train the encoder and the language model only using the English data set. And then you can try uh, to train the decoder and the language model only using the French data set. And finally, you come back to the 726 model and uh, train your model on the French uh, to English pairwise data. And uh, they often mention the uh, represent, uh, representation learning actually uh, focusing on the unit model representation. So we either focus on the image or text or audio, it's central, uh, but people often focus on the multi-model representation learning. So for example, the visual question answering task, there are at least two modalities, which is the image and the question, uh, which is actual text. And in some cases, you may consider uh, the knowledge base on the graph as uh, as additional uh, modality. So uh, how do we leverage the multi-model representation learning? The first uh, uh, solution is just to concatenate these two uh, embeddings. So let's look at this figure. Uh, there's uh, audio embedding, and there's a video embedding. And imagine that uh, we are going to perform a classification task based on these two data sets. So we just concatenate these two embedding, and we will get a shared representation. And then we will pass this shared representation to a classifier layer uh, and to perform the classification task. So the pros uh, for this model is that it is easy to implement and understand. And of course, that uh, it cannot capture the interconnections between uh, modalities. So how to interpret this? So uh, let's say, uh, actually, the connection between the first element in the audio embedding, and that's for example, and uh, the second element in the video uh, embedding, actually, we cannot leverage the connection between uh, any data points. And then an uh, advanced model was proposed, uh, which is, uh, oh, okay. So uh, this is actually in the bilinear pooling. Uh, so bilinear pooling uh, just performs and other products over these two modalities. So as you can see here, uh, X uh, is text input. So you can regard H and X as the text embedding and HY as the image embedding. And then you perform the output, outer products and you will get uh, uh, matrix HN in which the item HIG represents the correlation between the HI in HX and HG in HY. Uh, so let's analyze this model. Uh, the process that it really captures every possible in the collections between uh, any elements over two modalities. And uh, the cost is that, yeah, so first, uh, it is untractable. So uh, similar, let's imagine this is a classification task, uh, sentiment classification task. So if you just concatenate these two modalities, uh, let's imagine the embedded size is 100 and there are in total, 100 classes. So if you just concatenate these two embeddings in a final classifier layer, the size of the width matrix should uh, just be like uh, 200 by 100. But if you then uh, perform the classification directly on this matrix, uh, you will, so the size of the width matrix in the classification layer would be 100 by 100 by 100. Uh, so sometimes that is untractable. And uh, because this HM uh, contains much information, sometimes uh, some information are actually redundant. And uh, actually this message was proposed in 2000. Uh, later on, a couple of uh, advanced methods uh, were proposed. If you are interested, you can just uh, go through the relevant papers. Uh, I think I attached the name of paper here, but it seems that it doesn't appear. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, so here, uh, I think uh, this is a basic uh, introduction to the representation learning. And uh, our analogy, Abraham will uh, give an introduction on the auto encoder. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Jackson. Um, so as uh, Jackson was saying, uh, there are ways of learning multiple shared representations. One of those techniques is autoencoders. So um, as I said, you can learn uh, 
uh, a shared representation of different modalities with autoencoders. So if you have a voice and if you have an image and if you have text, you'll be able to learn shared representation with an autoencoder. So typically what we do is um, we'll train the auto, the, the all parts of the autoencoder uh, during training, but we'll only keep the encoder part of an autoencoder uh, when we're actually uh, extracting the representations because we can get the hidden representation uh, from the encoder once trained. Um, so one of the advantages of autoencoders is it's it's robust, so it, it's uh, it's also um, very useful when you have uh, multiple modalities and you're trying to reconstruct one of the modalities given the other ones. So uh, that's an advantage, but uh, its main disadvantage is probably it's uh, going to have, uh, it's going to need a lot of training and data to perform well, especially compared to the pooled representations. So this is what a general autoencoder looks like. So what you see here is a um, general encoder. So we have an input X and it's passed through some function. We know neural nets uh, represent some function. So it can be a CNN, an LSTM, or it can be a normal MLP. But so we have the input X uh, here, and then it's passed to uh, it's passed through a function to get the hidden representation. And that hidden representation is uh, uh, passed through another function g. Uh, and that function will uh, give us the reconstruction. So um, here we see some uh, example of a real thing. So this is like the general functional form. And what you see on the left is a real life example of an autoencoder. So we have multiple inputs. So this is a multimodal encoder. So we have an audio input and video input. So it passed through some um, layers. And then we have the shared joint representation of both the audio and the video. Um, so as during training, this decoder will also be trained so that we have the uh, reconstructed output and we can run our loss function to update uh, the encoder and the decoder of this network. So once trained, however, we'll only keep the encoder because we don't need the reconstruction. Um, we, we only need the hidden representation. So um, the way an autoencoder is trained is we give it an input and we're, we're also going to ask it to reconstruct the input. So here we have two inputs. Here we have two inputs and we're asking it to reconstruct both um, both the uh, so as you can see here we're asking it to reconstruct both the audio and the video so um, so uh, but what it's trivial I mean uh, trying to reconstruct the input that you already have is kind of trivial it's it's useless basically so the only interest is in finding the hidden representation and not simply reconstructing the input. Uh, um, so we have uh, multiple types of autoencoders. We have undercomplete autoencoders, denoising, sparse, contractive, and so many others. There are, uh, there are stochastic autoencoders in so of us. So let's try and see some of those types of autoencoders. So the first and probably the simplest to implement type of undercomplete autoencoder is uh, the undercomplete autoencoder. So uh, what's meant by undercomplete autoencoder is the code dimension or the dimension of the hidden representation is smaller than the dimension of the input. So um, let's say if you have a uh, 1024 uh, dimensional vector as your input and you have a 256 dimensional hidden representation, that would be an undercomplete autoencoder. So uh, typically, uh, the reason that we insist on having a smaller code dimension is so that the network actually learns something useful about the distribution of your input. And it doesn't just merely reconstruct whatever you gave it. So 
we want the representation to capture something meaningful about the distribution. So if we just simply let it reconstruct the image, it can do this by uh, making all the layers identity functions, which just give you back whatever you give it. it and we don't want that, of course, it, that would be the most useless thing to have. So um, typically we'll, we'll insist on having a smaller code dimension or a smaller dimensional hidden representation. So uh, the loss function we use uh, is of the for uh, the loss function on X and on the G of F of X. So as, 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 I, as I showed you previously, F of X is the encoder of the autoencoder and G of F of X is the decoder. So we'll, so G of F of X will be the reconstructed uh, version of the input. So our reconstruction is going to be G of F of X. So the loss function will take your input and your reconstruction uh, and computer loss typically our loss function is something like the mean scale or error loss, which, which we simply do complement wise and then um, see how much of a difference we have. So um, that's what we have for undercomplete autoencoders. Um, so the opposite of undercomplete autoencoders are called overcomplete autoencoders, where you have um, the code dimension larger than the input dimension. So it, in general, Overcomplete autoencoders aren't useful because if you have a dimensionality in your code dimension, which is larger than your input dimension, what ends up happening is the network will simply learn to copy its input without actually trying to learn anything useful about it. And we don't we don't really want this. So uh, although they're useful in some cases, in general, especially if you don't apply any regularization, undercomplete autoencoders aren't that useful. Uh, but we do have uh, overcomplete autoencoders, which are also regularized, as we'll see next. So we have what's called the sparse autoencoders. So here, the sparse autoencoders, they don't care about the uh, code dimension H. So your code dimension H can be equal to larger or smaller than the input dimension. Um, so uh, it can be overcomplete, but the the key thing is as you can see here the loss function is no longer just the loss on the input and the reconstruction we are also making it uh, depend on some function of h also this function of h is um, a sparsity constraint or it's uh, like a penalty where uh, less sparse solutions are discouraged so uh, typically this will be something like L1 norm on the hidden uh, representation. So we want to have a hidden representation with as many zeros as possible. Um, usually, again, the loss function will be uh, something like uh, mean squared error loss, which is really good when you have to compare those things complement-wise and you're trying to stack up the error um, at each location. Um, so the good thing about sparse autoencoders is because we're enforcing this sparsity constraint or because we're uh, trying to make it as sparse as possible, uh, even if it's overcomplete, you'll still be able to learn meaningful features with a uh, sparse autoencoder. Um, so the next thing is denoising autoencoders. So this is kind of like a somewhat different approach to um, the uh, training the autoencoder. So what we do here is instead of merely giving it the input and then just asking it to reconstruct the output and then enforce the constraints on the code dimension or on the um, on the number of zeros in the hidden representation, what we'll do here with denoising autoencoders is we'll give it a corrupted input. So um, this corrupted input will usually be something with a Gaussian noise or some form of noise added. So um, uh, we give it this uh, corrupted input and then we ask it to reconstruct the original input. So we have two versions of our input. One is corrupted by noise and another one is the original input, which has no noise in it. 
And what we'll do is we'll ask it to reconstruct the uh, right or the image we want from the corrupted input. Um, so this will force it to kind of learn the salient features in the image. Uh, we're also trying to show it what the important uh, things are in the image so that it knows, um, so that it captures the input distribution really well. Um, because it, it to reconstruct the clear input, it has to know what in the corrupted image constitutes some noise and what constitutes uh, signal we want. And if, if, if it can tell those two apart, it will have like a pretty good understanding of what the distribution looks like. Um, so um, this is a denoising autoencoder. So the loss function will again be something like a mean squared error. And as you can see here, we have the corrupted version of our input. We run it through encoder and decoder. And we try to reconstruct uh, I mean, we try to compute the error on the reconstruction and the, the uh, f of g of the corrupted input. Um, there's, there are also like uh, contractive autoencoders. So contractive autoencoders, uh, they're kind of, um, they, they kind of have this idea that uh, uh, getting the similar, uh, not so different representation for similar inputs. So if I give you an x, which is slightly different from uh, uh, some given input, your hidden representation must not change much. So this is what contractive autoencoders are. So um, they're, they're very useful uh, if, you, if, you, if you're especially trying to enforce the constraint of um, not widely changing uh, hidden representation. Um, so uh, this is for what we have for today. If you have any questions, you're welcome uh, from our time, please. Okay, so I guess there are no questions. I, I had a question. Okay. You you mentioned the 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 sparse encoding mm -hmm. to maximize yes. the amount of sparseness within the the encoding. Can you give an example of when yes. that would be useful? Um, an example of when sparsity would be useful. Yeah, because like um, like it makes mm -hmm. sense to do a dimension reduction with this uh, encoding. But then you showed an example that we can actually make it much, much larger. And the omega function is going to try and bias mm -hmm. it to be as sparse as possible. Why, why would we want something with, um, mm -hmm. with that uh, design? OK, so if I get your question, you're saying, why not just opt if we have so many zeros in the representation. Why not just opt for um, why not just opt for something which is uh, uh, of small, smaller dimension, but uh, not uh, something which where, where we don't actually need to um, uh, enforce the sparsity constraint. Yeah, was that your question? Okay, um, so. One thing I could think of is, for instance, let's say um, you have a um, uh, okay. Let's 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 say you want to have uh, the the things the representations to be as far as possible, right? So you want to learn like um, you want to learn something that resembles uh, one hat encoding, right? So uh, mm -hmm. what 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 happens is if you just using a under complete autoencoder, you'll end up learning dense features, which means um, distances between uh, distances between um, different two uh, samples might be closer than they distances should between be. different it could be so I mean I'm just giving an example. So if you want yeah. to have something that resembles one hot encoding where you want everything should be as far apart as possible. 
uh, and you want you, you don't have any beliefs in how far things apart, how far apart things should be like you want them to have to be as far apart as possible uh, i'm sorry i couldn't come up with like a specific application but no that's un that, that makes a lot of sense and, and then can yeah. you go back a few slides actually okay i can go back to um to where you show the graph of the autoencoder. Yeah, right there. So yeah. in here um, is the audio input, is the mm -hmm. decoder the exact same model as the audio reconstructor just, just flipped upside down? Um, that's actually a good question. It doesn't have to be, but typically they will be symmetric. So let's say, uh, yeah, as you said, if you have like, uh, let's say this is an MLP, if you have 124, Hidden dimensions of one, uh, 1024, 512, 256. Typically, what people do is like the decoder will be 256, 512, 1024. Um, but you don't necessarily have to do this so long as your uh, input dimension. So the only thing that I need to match are the X, the input, and the reconstructed one. They need to have the same dimensions. So long as you do it anywhere you like, you can do it. But typically, people tend to go for symmetric ones. That makes sense. And in, in, in this graph, it shows the uh, the audio input and video input both going into that shared representation. But in actuality, yes. are, are they actually uh, parallel? Like, are they? They're not summing to that shared representation, are they? That would. Uh, or how, how does the shared you get the you get the audio input output and the video input output, and mm -hmm. then you send you make sure mm -hmm. that those are the same, or you try to make sure that those are as, as similar as possible, and then those go to the reconstruction. It is yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. I see. I see. I see what you're trying to say. So this uh, generally doesn't have to be okay. So one way you said the one one thing you said was like you can send them right. It's possible. So you have two different networks learning uh, two kind of like uh, representations of their own and then you can sum them or you could have a weighted combination. But another way to do it would be, say you have an LSTM. So let's say you have a uh, audio input, which is a sequence and a video input, which is a sequence. And let's say for the sake of argument, they're of the same length. So what you do is like you could concatenate those two like you can concatenate the audio input at time step one and the video input at time step one as well. So you can you can concatenate them. So now this becomes like the input to your uh, LSTM or RNN at, at every time step. So the concatenated input will be your, your input to your LSTM. So you LSTM sees the audio and the video at the same time. So it's going to simply pass it through its... Uh, uh, like recurrent uh, weights and all the computations. So it will learn a single hidden representation for both of those. So, okay, of course it's a sequence. You'll have to do it for a couple of time steps, but at each time step, it's not just seeing the audio input or the video input. It's actually seeing everything because uh, the, the input, the audio input at time step T and the video input at time step P, T are concatenated and it's learning to um, uh, learn the hidden representation from the combined input. But as you said, you can just simply add, or one common thing is uh, using like projection maps, you have different um, representations done by two different networks, and you'll have projection maps that map them into that. So let's say you can have like something, you can say your audio, Initially, you learn something which is 10 by 24, and for your video, it could be something like uh, 2048, and then you use two different projection maps to map them into uh, linear layers, basically. You use two different linear layers to map them into the same dimension in sum. I see. So even though the, mm -hmm. the simplified picture looks like it might be using like a simple MLP, it's, it's probably because we have these sequential inputs, we're probably using recurrent networks or LSTMs to do this autoencoding? Um, so this is like a general figure. So you shouldn't really making any assumptions or what to what's happening here. So all we're saying is you will have an audio input that will undergo some processing, the video input that will undergo some processing through some function, and then they will 
will build a joint a shared representation for both. And from that shared representation, we can uh, reconstruct the audio and the video individually using two different functions. That's all we're saying, really. I see. So usually you can't have, uh, as I said, you can use like concatenate and then use an LSTM to learn the hidden representation, but typically you'll have different decoders for each modality. And we, we have to learn the decoder as well, right? Uh, but we're not, yeah, of course we have to learn it, but we're not particularly interested in it. We'll just throw it away once we have a way of learning the representation. There's no interest in giving um, some unknown shared representation, like of a audio video combination that we've never seen before to reconstruct the audio video? Of course, yeah, what you said makes sense. Of course, what you said makes sense. Yeah, okay, I guess. Um, yeah, but uh, of course, but typically, okay, I, I, I could potentially see what you're saying, but I'm not really sure as to where you just, I don't have any uh, application in mind where you'd find some H and you need to do the reconstruction, but yeah, what you're saying makes sense, yes. Yeah, I don't know either. I, it reminds me of like all those uh, crime you know, shows where they find something and then they have to, you know, enhance yeah, it. Yeah, remember, we're talking about some hidden represent. So like, if you have the decoder, which means you train the encoder, then you also have the decoder for it, right? So um, typically you do that training so that you'll be able to find, so you'll use the hidden representation somewhere else. Let's say you'll give it to another network, anyways. Uh, you're trying to use the H. So now uh, finding the H to find the reconstruction doesn't make, it's something you run through your network to find the H. And it doesn't kind of make sense to me, like what kind of application you need. So you got the H yourself and you're trying to reconstruct the image, but you already had the image. Uh, so that's my doubt, but I guess there could possibly be an application for it. Do you guys have any uh, Jupyter Notebook this week to show how to do a simple version of this or no? Uh, I actually had uh, one for the, the but it's, I, uh, I had one for the under complete one. So um, I kind of also have it for the sparse, but the rest don't have it. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll share it later as well. Uh, but as of now, it's just a simple. So all we okay. Let me actually try to share that one with you. It's kind of simple. Uh, maybe I'll share later. Uh, okay. Okay. So, um, okay, can you see, can you see my, can you see my screen? Yeah. My, okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so um, this is uh, pretty simple, a very basic example. So um, what we have here, I'm not gonna run it because it's, uh, it's not complete. So, um, so what we have here is we, uh, I'm, I tried to input the Cypher 10 data set. So uh, here's the Cypher 10. Okay, let me go to this interesting part. So we have an autoencoder here, right? Um, so this autoencoder, it has an encoder and a decoder, right? So the encoder, it uh, uh, contains, um, uh, two, two layers for now, so all, all, all I have are two layers. So a COM2D uh, with those parameters. And you can go and see that I, I have a symmetric one because my decoder, the final uh, layer of my decoder mirrors this one, right? So uh, I had a COM2D uh, in my encoder, which means I need a transpose convolution uh, in my decoder so and then here i had a what um 
So I had a uh, Conf2D, uh, which is which has like 64 out channels. I mean 64 in channels and uh, if map number of out channels. So then this is a symmetric one. So this uh, will be the the first layer of your decoder will end up being a convolution with uh, F maps number of uh, in channels and 64 out channels. So, um, so this is a symmetric autoencoder. So typically, uh, the, the the only thing that's different from what you've seen up until now is um, up until now is uh, this. This loss, of course, it's it's not so different, but we'll use this mean squared error loss, and then all you have to do is, in your in your training, all you have to do is, you pass the images uh, to your through your model as usual. You get your reconstruction. So in the forward of uh, in the forward of the model, what's happening is, uh, we have an X, and uh, an H, so uh, I'm returning both the X and the H, uh, just in case you need to uh, do something like a sparse autoencoder where you need to apply a sparsity constraint you know, or you need to apply a, a sparsity loss or sparsity penalty on the hidden dimension. So uh, all this is doing is passing your inputs through your uh, encoder getting the hidden representation and passing it through your decoder, returning the output as well as the hidden representation. So uh, here we'll have the reconstruction and all we do is pass it through our reconstruction and image. Um, next, uh, what we could do is uh, we, we could, so this is just uh, basic training you guys have been doing throughout the semester, but one thing that you can also do as well is to find some, uh, so this is a regular, regularized loss where you have um, a typical loss, let's say. So it takes in like the loss and this is your penalty, which can be, uh, so uh, if you remember in the slides, I had something plus omega of h, right? So it doesn't have, to, omega of h can be some constant times some function of h, right? So penalty will be the constant and uh, so what you'll do is then you'll, you'll, you'll pass your outputs and your features through your normal loss and uh, what you'll do is um, uh, you'll, you'll uh, add to it uh, so in this case all that's happening is uh, I'm using the, um, the uh, L1 penalty so I'm using the L1 penalty on the hidden dimension. Um, so you just sum those two, and then you have your new loss. Of course, you could just do this outside if you if you prefer. You don't have to do this inside. So you, you might as well do this part. You, you can you can just do this in your training loop. You can do it here. So this this part you can just simply use this one as well. Um, so. Um, this this example uh, it works, but uh, I kind of wanted it to be instructive so that you guys will be able to see how the code dimension affects um, the the kind of uh, how good of reconstruction you can get and uh, the how sparsity constraints affect uh, uh, how the sparsity penalty uh, affects uh, your representation. But it's, it's as of now, it's not as instructive as I want it to be. Mm -hmm. So that's why I haven't shared this one yet. But uh, I'll try and uh, uh, add in the bits which are, uh, which can be. So this works, this code works, but it's not instructive. So uh, the hyperparams I used for it aren't as great. So I hope this was useful. Very useful. Okay, great. Any other question?
Okay, so I guess that's it. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, and I hope I hope you guys have a good time finishing Hall 3. All the best with the rest of the Hall. Thank you.